I'd like to start by celebrating what you Vermonters do every first Wednesday of the year, is most first Wednesdays of the year, which is to gather in public libraries and discuss, debate, analyze, go deep into a variety of topics. Uh, to me, the public library, I'm an immigrant from Mexico. Um, and uh, when I was growing up, the public library in my native country uh, did not have the versatility, the, the robust presence that public libraries have in the United States. And uh, it was very far from this feast of intellectual life that Vermonters have created for themselves. It seems to me that the entire country should be doing what Vermont does. Um, it is for many of us who have, the, who have had the, the privilege and the honor of visiting the different libraries in the state, really an opportunity to uh, get to know the people, uh, understand what, what, what it is that they are interested in, and mostly to appreciate what democracy is all about. I think the public libraries are the place where democracy, the American democracy really takes place. I will be talking to you tonight about Yiddish, my first language. I am the grandchild of Eastern European Jews who arrived to Mexico at the very beginning of the 20th century when they were not allowed for immigration quota reasons to come to the United States. They, some of them settled in the Caribbean, others went to Central America. Eventually, the majority of that group moved to Mexico and Yiddish was the language of my domestic life, uh, the language in which I communicated with my parents and my grandparents, the language of instruction too. It was the private language as a minority group, um, the, the language that we Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, that is European Jews from Central, uh, uh, from the Central, Central Europe, what it's called the Pale of Settlement, used to engage with one another. And then there was the public language. Spanish with which we interacted with the Mexican population. I want to talk to you about that nature that Yiddish has, the quality of having the, 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 the character of defining a minority, no matter what the, where that minority has found itself. In the United States, English is, uh, Yiddish is mostly uh, understood to be uh, an immigrant language. That is the language with which the Ashkenazi Jews, uh, poor uh, victims of pogroms, a Russian word that means a outburst against Jews, and other anti-Semitic explosions were victims of and were pushed out uh, of that region of Poland and Russia and Belarus, uh, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and ended up immigrating to different parts of the world, mostly the United States, but not exclusively. Argentina was also a magnet of immigration, South Africa, Australia, Canada, and of course the, the promised land, Palestine, which eventually would become the, the Jewish state. I, I, I will talk about the role of Yiddish in Israel as well. But being an immigrant language uh, here in America and in the various Americas, Mexico and Colombia and Canada and Argentina are also part of that vast understanding, vast continent that we call the Americas, is just one aspect of what the language um, has been. Yiddish is an ancient form of communication it has over a, a thousand years of age. It started roughly around the ninth century in the region of Germany next to the Rim. And at the very beginning, uh, between the ninth century and the 13th century, it was a language mostly used by women, children, and uh, the illiterate population. It's very important to keep this in mind because Yiddish now is a language of culture. It's a language of politics. It's a language of resistance too. And it's a language that connects us to the land and to a particular civilization 
that thrived over that millennium. Uh, but at the very beginning, that language was seen as unworthy, Ill illegitimate by scholars, rabbis, Talmud, Tal Talmudists, that is people who engaged in Talmudic discussion. It was seen as a, a kind of a prostituted or a hybrid and illegitimate, as I mentioned, form of communication that was neither high German nor Hebrew, which are the two roots that gave birth to the, the Yiddish language. Um, it is important at this point to mention that Jews have been a, a very tough machine of language production. Over the many diasporas, Jews, minorities from Greece to the Latin Empire, to Italy, to Iran, uh, France, Germany, have always looked for ways to communicate internally with other Jews in a particular region, and then externally with the uh, overall population of that part of the world in which they live. And as a result, they have produced, we have produced uh, an, uh, an astonishing amount of languages over time. Yiddish is probably the most important, the most productive, the most ambitious of all Jewish languages with the exception of Hebrew. But here are, here's a, a very short and improvised list of other Jewish languages. Ladino, of course, the language of Sephardic Jews, that is the Jews that lived in Spain and after 1492 spread all over a multiple a series of diasporas from Italy and the Netherlands to Northern Africa, to Palestine again, in various parts of the Americas during the colonial period. Like Yiddish, that is a mixture of German and Hebrew, Latino is a mixture of Spanish and Hebrew. There is Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Portuguese, Judeo-Farsi, um, a whole variety of languages that the Jews have created. Why did Yiddish become such an important one? In what way did Yiddish surpass all the other Jewish languages, ex again, with the exception of Hebrew? And how did it become an immigrant language? Well, this is a, a, a fascinating theme in and of itself. When Yiddish came about in the 13th century in Europe, there was a a, a period of, um, of, of the medieval landscape where religion played a major role. But just about two or three centuries later, the arrival of, on the one hand, the European Enlightenment, and on the other hand, the Jewish Enlightenment within the Jewish communities, that is called the Haskalah, gave birth to the, to the possibility of the Jews in Eastern Europe and in other parts of Europe becoming full-fledged citizens of that vast old continent. And the language in which they began to communicate with one another was Yiddish. Yiddish enabled the Jews from certain parts of Lithuania, called Litvaks, to be in dialogue with the Jews of Galicia, that region of Poland that changed sides so often. And so there, there, there was the Galicianer Yiddish, the Yiddish that was defined by the forms in, in parlances of the Jews from Galicia that was very different from the lexicon, the, the grammar, the syntax from the Litvak Jews, the Lithuanian Jews. Though just like the difference between the English of Canada and the English of India and the English of Scotland, they were unified. It was the same language, but uh, there were nuances. And in that sense, it quickly became a lingua franca, the language that European Ashkenazi Jews would use to communicate with one another when they were not neighbors, but they lived in the same region. And the, just that this, the language that distinguished them as a minority. Because at that time, the Enlightenment provoked an explosion of culture in Europe 
that had to do with uh, political uh, explorations, the emerging novel uh, in different countries, folklore, ethnography, poetry, Jews in the 18th century and in the 19th century wanted to be just like every other nation in Europe. They started to create their own novels, their own poetry collections, their own theater. Jews did not have theater in the Middle Ages and only in the 19th century. They awakened, they woke up to the idea that uh, the prohibition against images could be put aside and theater could be embraced. And it was done in Yiddish too. The very, uh, the, the very birth of Yiddish literature, which is a crucial moment, in the development of this uh, Yiddish language civilization takes place in the middle of the 19th century when a number of Polish, Belarusian, uh, Lithuanian uh, writers who had been writing in Hebrew because they thought that that was the language in which their work would be best remembered, realized that they didn't have many readers, that most readers, if they read, when they read, they read in Yiddish. I'm thinking of Sholem Aleichem, eh, of eh, Itzhok Leibush Peretz, eh, of eh, Abramovich, who went by the name of Mendele Moiches Forim. And they were the ones that decided to switch from Hebrew as a literary language to Yiddish, translating their own novels and then just writing in Yiddish. And they quickly found out that there was a vast, a, a hungry, a, a intellectually curious a readership all over the place that was interested in what they were writing and in what other writers, pedagogues, educators, a, preachers were doing in Yiddish as well. And so the birth of the Jewish press, the birth of the Jewish novel a, really happened in Yiddish and Yiddish has the, the, the DNA of the arrival of Ashkenazi Jews to modernity. What did it feel to be ostracized? What did it feel to live in little shtetls, in little towns uh, in the countryside uh, or in ghettos in the city? Uh, how, how did Jews meditate their own challenges, their own difficulties as both citizens, but second rate citizens in Germany, in Poland, in Hungary, in Lithuania, in Latvia, and many other countries. The language by then had become the main conduit of the, the, the Yiddish and the Jewish soul. Yiddish in Yiddish means Jewish. And uh, the language therefore means a Jewish language. There's another way of referring that many Jews used to refer to Yiddish and this is the Mameloshen the mother tongue, because that was the language, just as it had happened to me, <coughs> that was fed uh, from very early on by mothers to their children, <coughs> the language of the domestic realm and the language which, with which many of them grew up, their first tongue, the, 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 the native tongue. Two major events happen at the, at, in the first half of the 20th century. Both of them devastating and will have an enormous effect on the localization of Yiddish and its ultimate impact. One really? of them, of course, is the Holocaust, 1939, 1945. There are very few languages in the history of the world. There are approximately 30,000 languages that humankind has created from the, the beginning of time to the present. Only about 6,000 languages really achieved a status of either a dialect or a standardized a, a language like English and French and Yiddish. Transitioning from being a dialect that is a mostly oral way of communication or, non -stand or having a non-standardized grammar and syntax to being a full-fledged language with dictionaries, with a standardized um, form of communication is really the purview of very few of these languages. And even many of the Jewish languages that I mentioned to you at the beginning remain dialects, just a group of Jews 
no dictionaries necessarily, and the, they lasted for one generation, two generations. Yiddish became a formal language. There was a way to spell English, no matter Yiddish, no matter where it was, it was located, and, and there was also a, a way of instructing uh, in Heders, in uh, Schules, Yiddish to the next generation. The Holocaust is one of the most cathartic moments in history, in Jewish history, and certainly in the history of, the, of Yiddish, because out of 12 million Jews that lived, roughly a little less than 12 million Jews that lived in Eastern Europe, uh, in Europe in general, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, only about half of them survived and very, very few remained in place but uh, were exterminated uh, by the Nazis, or, and this is the second event that happened in Jewish life, uh, as dramatic, uh, certainly not as tragic, but as, 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 as uh, impactful in, in the sense of uprooting an entire population. And that is the immigration that took place from around 1870 or 1880 uh, to about, 1930 or 1940 of Eastern European Jews to other parts of the world. If you think of it, most languages are born, develop, and if they die, they die in the very same place of birth. Yiddish now is spoken globally. It is truly an international language. It is spoken in, his, in Israel today, in Buenos Aires, in Johannesburg, in New York, in Los Angeles, uh, in Toronto, and uh, also in certain parts of Eastern Europe where it has been kept alive. The, the Yiddish that came to America in particular was a Yiddish that by the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century had become quite diversified. The, the various regions spoke uh, a different type of Yiddish. There was sometimes competition between those that lived in Vilna, with those that lived in Odessa, with the, and those that lived in Warsaw. And each of them had the pride of being the ones that spoke Yiddish in a particular way, or the ones that had defined the novel, or the short story, or the poetry, or rabbinical discussion in another way. And by then, Whereas the rabbis continue to embrace Hebrew as the language of education, as the language of learning, uh, the sacred texts, Yiddish had become the secular way of communication for Eastern European Jews in a very diverse one. There were even at that point non-Jews that used Yiddish to communicate with Jews. The arrival to the United States created a schism in the history of Yiddish. The, the coming of immigrants, most of them poor, eh, uneducated, eh, hopeful, but escaping persecution to the United States meant that they felt unified as a group, as a, as a minority group. Eh, they were through Ellis Island directed to places like the Lower East Side in New York, and from there dispersed through uh, various corners, various paths and directions in the United States. But there was a new challenge in America, and that challenge had to do with assimilation. Just as other immigrant languages had done prior to Yiddish, the first generation, that is the immigrant generation, had kept very loyal to them, say Italian, or French, or German, or um, is the different Slavic languages. But the children of the immigrants were sent to uh, English language schools, to national schools, and they spoke English at school, they spoke English on the streets, and they spoke Yiddish at home. Uh, slowly they grew up with these two senses of having one private language, very much in the way that I had, the, the domestic one, Yiddish, and the national language, the public language, English. I find it very interesting, and I, I'm sure that some of, some of the members in the audience will, will have the emotions 
uh, or understand uh, uh, what I'm referring to. Whereas in Mexico, uh, in South Africa, in Canada, uh, in Argentina, Yiddish remained the language for the children of the immigrants and the grandchildren of the immigrants. I am a grandchild of immigrants. In the United States, the pressure was so intense that by the time the children of the immigrants, the Jews that were already born in the United States, grew up, Yiddish was no longer their language. English was their language. And they knew a few words. Maybe they could understand what their parents were saying. But, and here is the key, very often their parents used Yiddish for their children not to understand. The opposite, if you think about it, of what language is really designed to. Language brings us together, language engages us, language establishes a dialogue. The children, grandchildren of Yiddish speaking immigrants often talk of their parents using Yiddish when they wanted to discuss an issue of money or an issue of somebody having some sort of trouble or some political issue. And they would switch to Yiddish for the children not to understand. So in some sense, it became a kind of forbidden language, the language of the older generation, the language that was no longer theirs. And they felt, they feel to this day in my research, in the, in the travels that I do, as a sense of having been pushed out or not having been included in full. And a, that results in a kind of nostalgia. Oh, I wish my parents had allowed me in. I wish I could speak Yiddish today the way somebody in Mexico or in South Africa or in Canada could use. And maybe that explains why that nostalgia, maybe that explains why there is a, a kind of a desire for return these days. Yiddish should have been erased altogether. It was erased, it was attempted to be erased by the Nazis. Assimilation was also a form of erasing of Yiddish in America, and it should have totally disappeared. But that nostalgia has kept Yiddish among secular Jews alive. And on campuses today, Yiddish is a language that is making a comeback on, in synagogues. Uh, and there are cultural centers like the Yiddish Book Center in Massachusetts, where I teach in an institution that I adore, work very closely with. And in fact, this book that we published last year, How Yiddish Changed America and How America Changed Yiddish, which gives the excuse or the, the, the reason for this discussion, is done in collaboration with the Yiddish Book Center. It brings together many articles, short stories, poems, recipes that this wonderful institution in the campus of Hampshire College in Western Mass has been doing for over 40 years. This book is, 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 was, was produced in order to celebrate the four decades of the Yiddish, of the Yiddish Book Center. It, the Yiddish Book Center and YIVO and other institutions, the Klesmer efforts that are taking place eh, nationally really show the desire to reconnect with Yiddish and the way for a younger generation to be brought back. I wonder how far that is going to go. And here I wanna make a, a detour and then I'm gonna to return to this topic. Yiddish in America, in this process of being a kind of ostracized by immigrants in connection with their children, was a language that very quickly got intertwined with English. And there was something that was called Yinglish. That is the mix of Yiddish and English that was neither Yiddish nor English. And it's very similar to another linguistic phenomenon that I feel very close to and, and have researched for a long time, Spanglish, the mixing of Spanish and English that is neither Spanish nor English in that about 50 million Latinos in the United States speak today in one way or another. Yinglish was the language of 
the immigrants in the Lower East Side eh, after five years, 10 years, the language of the children who grew up listening to Yiddish at home, but then really functioning eh, their entire life in English. I wanna use one example that I think will be very, very useful to understand the plight of Yinglish, eh, what it meant, what it symbolized, and, uh, and, and how it, 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 it moved a, a, along. When Isaac Bashevis Zinger, arguably the most important American Yiddish writer of all time, it first arrived to the United States as an immigrant from Warsaw, from Poland in 1933. He was already in his late 90s. His older brother had come to the United States, a Israel Yeshua Zinger, the older brother had been working for Forwards, the Jewish Daily Forward, the most important Yiddish newspaper of all time. He was a correspondent and then a staff member, brought in Bashev Zinger in order to also help him and hopefully get at some point a staff position at Forwards. Bashev Zinger, who went by Bashevis, his real name was Yitzchok Zinger, was shocked, according to his own memoirs by the state of Yiddish in America in the 1930s. For him, it, it, it was full of cacophonies. It wasn't the real, the poor, the legitimate Yiddish of Varsha, of Warsaw, or the Yiddish from Vilna, or the Yiddish from other part, parts of the Pale of Settlement of, of Europe. It was a kind of prostituted, contaminated language that was a moving away from its roots. Now, I want you to think for a second how ironic all this is. Yiddish was born out of a mixture of Hebrew and German. The mixture itself must have created a lot of discomfort in the rabbis and in the Talmudists that I was telling you about because it was, it was not real Hebrew, it was not real German, and at one point by the 20th century, there was a sense that Yiddish had become pure, that it had distilled itself, that now it was a lofty, elevated, intellectually worthy language. And when Bashevitz Singer arrived in the United States, he was confronted with the idea that that purity was now in decline, that Yiddish was going, as he put it, to the dogs, that it didn't have a future. And According to his own telling, Bashevis was, was a kind of schwitzer that, uh, you know, he would talk a lot, but sometimes falsify a good fiction writer. Um, it wasn't quite true that he went into a writer's block and couldn't write because he couldn't communicate with the immigrant Yiddish generation, Yiddish population of the Lower East Side, of Coney Island, uh, because the words that he had, the sentences, connected him to the high uh, brow uh, Yiddish writers of the 19th century and not to the second rate polluted Yiddish language of the immigrants in the United States. Uh, the truth is that he switched pseudonyms into pseudonyms and wrote for forwards and for other publications, all sorts of texts, sometimes in very uh, elevated Yiddish, sometimes himself already giving in to the pressure of communicating in a language that was looking for ways to adapt, that needed to survive in any way. And whereas at the beginning, he rejected that a hybrid nature, that contamination, a, he quickly came to understand the way many other immigrant Yiddish writers that came from a, other parts of, of Europe and a, into America, a Rochel Korn, a Katya Molodovsky, Bashev Singer's older brother, Peretz a, a, a Markish, a Chaim Grade, who really tried to protect Yiddish much more than, than others, that uh, not communicating with the masses again would be a big mistake and that you could write for yourself um, and maybe save those writings for future generations or that you needed to be in touch in one way or another with the palpitating, the, the, the effervescence, uh, effervescent nature of the immigration that was in itself transforming Yiddish. 
The early American Yiddish writers are writers that switch from in Yiddish into English. Abraham Kahan, Anzia Yezerska, for instance, uh, Henry Roth, who, who wrote that astonishing novel called uh, Call It Sleep, where he tries to recreate in English the broken, fractured patterns of Yiddish. And uh, it was only to last maybe for 20 years, for 30 years, the children of the immigrants, um, people like Philip Roth, Grace Paley, Cynthia Ozick, would now have English, English as their first language and would look back at Yiddish as the language of the Alte Chaim, the old home, a, a language that meant for them a lot, but not many of them were not able to, to, to communicate in it anymore. But Shelley Singer is a very interesting example because he would, he, since he had arrived in the late 20s, in his late 20s, and uh, really settled in the United States in the 30s, um, he would remain loyal. That's a very late moment for an immigrant to switch languages. He became fluent in English, but he would always have an accent. And he became the most successful Yiddish writer in America, probably with the, with the exception of another a previous writer, Sholem Ash, who also became incredibly successful and was nominated for the Nobel Prize that Zinger ended up receiving. Uh, as Shevin Zinger came to the realization that if he wanted to be an, a successful writer, a successful Yiddish writer in America, he would need to do it in translation. And this is, a, this is a fascinating phenomenon because he couldn't write directly in English. He enlisted an army of translators, many of whom did not speak a word of Yiddish. They were children of immigrants. Yiddish was no longer their language. And uh, they were the ones to whom Bashevis dictated his stories. He would, the, 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 the myth goes, that he would invite them, most of them were women. He was a womanizer, he was a scandalous human, a human, a womanizer. He would invite them to his house. He would say, would you translate me into English? They would take a notebook or, 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 or a typewriter and he would translate his own Yiddish story into a kind of makeshift English that they would write as if in dictation. They would then go home revise it, come back, and he would correct it, he would add things, he would take others. And for that reason, eventually Bashevi Zinger talked about the English versions of his stories he published in The New Yorker, in Playboy, Esquire, Harper's Magazine. He would describe the English as his second originals because he had worked on them, he didn't want to see them as, as, as translations but as or as copies. They were the, the real thing now that he had worked on, although he wasn't the original author. He didn't author them in that language. And it's very interesting that the majority of short stories that was in novels that Vashevi Zinger wrote ended up being translated from the, in, from the English to French, to German, to Spanish, and not from the Yiddish, because there were very few Yiddish translators into say German and into Spanish, but also because Bashevis had de facto endorsed the English language originals as the second originals, but the ones that people should use. Now I want to wrap this up with one a quick tour through, through American a popular culture. How did Yiddish changed America and how America changed Yiddish. Well, it's impossible to think about Hollywood without Mel Brooks, Sid Caesar, Woody Allen. Um, it's impossible to think about American television without Jerry Seinfeld, without uh, Sarah Silverstein. And all of them are authors who have Yiddish in their background, sometimes would use Yiddish in their work, uh, and yet they made their stamp, their signature in English. Uh, there are famous uh, musicians and songwriters who were original Yiddish speakers uh, that ended up 
writing very famous American songs, songs even for Christmas that uh, were, have become a staple of American culture, but they were Yiddish bochers in, in uh, Yiddish, Yiddish young men. Uh, Yiddish, however, has left an imprint in the English language, the way other immigrant languages have, maybe much more. You don't have to be Jewish to know uh, words like chutzpah or schmendrick or to schlep uh, or bagel or many others of that kind. It, sociolinguists talk about fossilized words that come from the immigrant language and become part of the vast reservoir of the English language that can be used very often by a non-immigrants or non-Jews in this case as words of their own. I remember a, very clearly as an immigrant a, when I heard Al Gore use the word chutzpah uh, when receiving the nomination for vice president. And uh, it, it shocked me, but it also made me feel that Yiddish had arrived, had entered the mainstream, and that it had entered in a way that probably the original immigrants felt uh, uh, ambivalent about. It was no longer Yiddish. It was only this fossilized elements that, that continued. But uh, nonetheless, it came from that background. Where is Yiddish going now? Who speaks it today? What is its future? Well, uh, there are, according to some accounts, about 200,000 Yiddish speakers worldwide. The vast majority of them are Orthodox Jews who lived in Israel, who live in the United States, and in other parts of the world. Uh, the, the Haredi in Israel or the Orthodox in the United States speak a Yiddish that is also bastardized, is a mix of Yiddish and Hebrew and English. They don't write high literature in Yiddish. They don't discuss the Talmud in Yiddish. Yiddish is the language of transactions, of business, of day-to-day -day life. And it is back to being the language of women and children though Hebrew is a very powerful a way of communication, and so is English among the Orthodox in the United States. Young American Jews are uh, going back to Yiddish, but I have to be honest with you, will Yiddish survive among them? Will it become again a, a fluid, a mainstream language? Well, my own vision is that languages that survive, and many languages perish, uh, languages that survive need to have a, a reason to survive. Uh, not only nostalgia, but some sort of practical, functional element. You live in that language for a, a particular mission that you have, and you are part of a group that will push it forward. This brings me to my last thought, and that is why Israel is a country that uses Hebrew and not Yiddish. And uh, I will take this opportunity to say something about Yiddish and other uh, Jewish languages that Yiddish does, that Hebrew do, do, does not share. The Jewish languages in the diaspora, Yiddish, Ladino, uh, Judeo-Italian, but particularly Yiddish because of its size, because of its ambition. Uh, the Yiddish in the diaspora never had an address or a flag or a central government or a bank or a stamp. Yiddish was a nation free, nation, national language. Uh, a, a famous linguist, a, a Yiddish linguist a, of a, a, in the early part of the 20th century said that the distinction between a dialect and a language is that a language has an army and a navy to defend it, and a dialect does not. Yiddish never had an army. Nobody defended Yiddish, and that's probably one of the reasons why Yiddish perished in part in uh, gas chambers and in concentration camps. When many of the uh, 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 pioneers moved to Israel, the vast majority of the first Aliyah, the first 
big wave, were Yiddish speakers. And yet they had the dream that the new nation, the new Jewish nation, should go back to biblical times and use the language that had been used during the Davidic period in a modernized fashion. And there was one particular Zionist, Eliezer ben Yehuda, who orchestrated a revival of Hebrew, uh, the resurrection of Hebrew, in order for it to become the national language. It's one of the great miracles in Jewish life that Hebrew today is spoken by so many people in Israel and in other parts, not only for religious reasons, but mainly for national reasons. Hebrew has an army and a navy. Hebrew has a government. Hebrew has stamps. Hebrew has a central bank. Yiddish does not. And there are stories that I could tell you of how Ben-Gurion, the father of the Jewish state, would forbid the ministers in the early days of the nation of speaking Yiddish when most of them had it as their first language in their first a governmental meetings because he didn't want Yiddish to be the language of the state. For many Zionists, Yiddish was the language of the diaspora, the language of the hunchback Jew, the language of the vulnerable Jew, the language of being hit by anti-Semites. Hebrew was going to be the language of the new Jew, the new man, the new nation. And for a long period of time in Israel, Yiddish was ostracized, the way it had been ostracized in other parts uh, of its history, and uh, looked down and uh, kind of forced out of the emerging new nation. Today, Israel looks more benignly at Yiddish. There are uh, various sites of the Israeli government that want to foment Yiddish, the learning of Yiddish, though never in any way competing with Hebrew. Uh, one of my colleagues, a, a scholar of Yiddish, says that there's a difference between Hebrew and Yiddish and that Hebrew today has become a more masculine language, whereas Yiddish is a more feminine language. I wrap this up, dear friends, now by telling you I'm not sure that that is true, but it's a very provocative thought. Yiddish remains a diaspora language, is a global language. If Jews have become a global entity, Yiddish has been the companion of that global enterprise. And if it, there is one place in the world where there's an address, so to speak, it's in America where Yiddish has really made a stamp. Yiddish is the language of that very successful immigrant group, the Jews, who are seen as models by other immigrants of arrival, of climbing the ladder and being able to be mainstream. The question is, did we go too far? Did we sacrifice too much in the process of becoming Americans? Is Yiddish one of the casualties? Can nostalgia keep Yiddish alive for how long? How and what will it take for Yiddish to continue being a language of literature, a language of education, eh, or will it become like Latin, a language through which we can study a past eh, and that it's simply the purview of scholars in universities and in other institutions of high learning eh, used by the Orthodox to communicate, but no longer a uh, sophisticated a forum that will mark, it will become a statement of new generations of Jews. I think that's a question to, that is left for the future. For the time being, Yiddish has made a big stamp linguistically, politically, culturally, socially in the United States and in other parts of the world. And it still feels to someone like me that it is the language in which you can say things that you can't really say in any other. There's no language to curse like Yiddish. And maybe there's also no language to fall in love or to relate to somebody else like Yiddish, but that's nostalgia. Thank you very much. And I'll bring Star back and maybe 
for some questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan. Um, that was lovely and, uh, and a wonderful uh, summation. Um, we do have some questions for you. One is, the first one is, did our speaker contact Sephardic Jews in Mexico when you lived there? Sure. I grew up a, a, a Yiddish speaker, but uh, there were two concurrent immigrations in Mexico. One was the Ashkenazi one, and the other one was the Ottoman one, the Jews that had come from the Ottoman Empire, Syria, Lebanon, eh, Greece, eh, the former Yugoslavia. Eh, many of them spoke French. Some of them spoke Arabic. A few spoke Ladino. I had friends that spoke Ladino, that taught me Ladino. And eventually I would become very interested in the literature that Ladino writers would produce not only in Mexico, but in different parts of Latin America. Latino eh, never really evolved eh, to produce masterpieces like eh, Tevye der Milchiker, Tevye the Dairyman, the source of a eh, fiddler on the roof. But it is the language of liturgy. It is the language of children's songs. Eh, it is the language of recipes. I love Latino. It's also uh, very useful for scholars like me to a Latino to understand how Spanish, Latino is very close to medieval and Renaissance Spanish, uh, the Spanish of Cervantes, for instance. And some of us can study certain patterns of Latino to know how people pronounce certain words uh, in the Spain of 1605, when Don Quixote was published, for instance. So yes, very quickly, the answer to your question is Latino, though never, as important among the Mexican Jews. There are today between 30 and 35,000. Um, like, unlike Yiddish, it was, was a, what is an important language and one that I have learned and that I feel very close to. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, we did have a question about the best way to buy your book, to buy the book that you held up. Um, and then we had some answers that appeared in the chat, which was, you know, contact your local bookstore or the Hebrew Center for the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or Yiddish it's Center a, for the book, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Yiddish, the, the book is How Yiddish Changed America and How America Changed Yiddish. I co-edited it with a colleague, a wonderful colleague who teaches at Wellesley, uh, Josh Lambert. Uh, it is available in, you know, in all bookstores. You can also buy it directly from the publisher. The, the publisher is called Restless Books. If you Google Restless, you can go directly to them. It's a small independent publisher. I'm connected with it. And the you know, small independent publishers depend, uh, I, I'm going to use here a, a famous Tennessee will be, depend on, in the kindness of strangers. <laughs> and so if you can support Restless, uh, I think you will enjoy very much the book. It has uh, all sorts of ingredients, so to speak, recipes that come from the Yiddish, short stories, poems, essays, Emma Goldman's speech originally in Yiddish trying to abolish, ab ab abolish marriage or bringing in divorce into the landscape of Yiddish speakers and so on. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll also get it for the library. But everybody should run out and buy it as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did have a question about uh, the generations and the ages of people uh, who speak Yiddish now all over the world, but, uh, but you covered that. Um, and now it says, how does humor play a role in the durability of Yiddish in America? Oh my God, that is a terrific <laughs> question. And I truly was hoping for it. Humor, it, Yiddish, you know, Yiddish has pathos. Yiddish has the angst of a society that was vulnerable, that was beaten up, and yet remained hopeful, devoted to its own survival, and looking for ways, culturally and linguistically, to get out of trouble in any, any fashion that was imaginable. Um, it, would, it was sometimes said that when there was a, a terrible a outburst of a, a anti-Semitism, the, the Yiddish joke would arrive faster than any policeman for uh. many, many minutes. In other words, that the government would never help, but the Jewish humor would always be there to help. 
So in America, Yiddish is the, the, the base for the humor that you hear in many of the stand-up comedians that I was mentioning, uh, you know, Mel, some of them stand-up comedians, others comedians in, the, in different ways, like Sarah Silverman in, in Seinfeld. In Yiddish, you, the, the simple expressions, uh, for instance, there's an expression of somebody who has lost their mind or who be, has mental illness, and he convinced himself of becoming sick. And it might sound like uh, paranoid, but Yiddish in many of these expressions, another expression is you should hang like a lamp uh, for somebody that you don't like. Um, many of these expressions are really a manifestation of the, the beautiful humor that Jews have used, I would say against the apocalypse. It is the best response uh, against that apocalypse that is always just one step away. Humor has been a strategy of survival. Now, humor is not present in every Jewish diaspora. Ladino doesn't have the type of humor that Yiddish has. Judo-Italian doesn't have that type of humor. Yiddish, the European Jewish pathos, is very much about expressions that will help you smile in the face of, of misery. And uh, if, there's, if anything is Yiddish, that's Yiddish. The capacity to laugh in these very desperate moments. Well, as you were talking about Singer, I was reflecting on those wonderful children's stories that he wrote oh. that just have me on the yeah, floor yeah. every time yes. I read them. They are really laugh out loud and, and the stories of Helm. I, I love those stories of Helm. Star and I, it's very, it's, it's ironic because Bashevis Singer, um, you know, he's the most photographed Yiddish writer of all time. Uh, but most of the photographs that we have about, of Bashevis Singer are of him already as an old man in his 50s, in his 60s. He looks like a Zayde, a grandfather uh, in Yiddish. And yet the irony here is that he had one child uh, of his first marriage, but he. Uh, he, he, he didn't recognize him. That child with his mother went to Israel, became an Israeli, and Bashevis and the child didn't, uh, Israel, uh, Zamir, would not talk for many, many years. Eventually, Bashevis would ask his son to become his translator. And yet, Bashevis at one point, reaching 60, it was invited by a New York publishing house, by an editor, to consider writing Yiddish stories for American children in English, to kind of translate them. And he came up with beautiful adaptations of the Helm story. Helm is a perfect example of what Yiddish is. Helm is a mythical town. It's spelled C-H-E-L-M. It's a mythical town where supposedly everybody is so bright that everybody's stupid. The Helmites <laughs> are all stupid. And those are perfect children's stories. My children, I, they grew up, me reading the stories of Helm that Bashevi Zinger had written uh, at night. There's a beautiful one about a carp that, uh, that doesn't want to recognize the rabbi of Helm and the, Helm, the Helmites have to punish this carp and they go into a conclave and decide what kind of punishment this, this, uh, this carp is going to have. And in the end, they decide that they are going to drown the carp. <laughs> that last line would make both my boys laugh so hard they would be hard to really put them to bed. And every time I go out on a, on a moonlit night and see the sparkling snow, I think of the, the snow in Helm. <laughs> it's a beautiful story, too, of the... the they love the pristine aspect of the snow in Helm, but there's a man who comes on Shabbat in, in, from, to the synagogue and just messes up with the footprints. So they have to figure out how are they going to make him not to walk around and mess up all the snow. And finally, the Helamites decide that they'll bring together a group that will carry this man so that he <laughs> doesn't step on the snow. Beautiful. Uh, so someone uh, someone tried a Google translation from English to Yiddish. Uh, Everything I said in Yiddish <laughs> now in Google, oh, you get vault. 
<laughs> uh, someone else commented that a woman at a synagogue in Maine told me that Hebrew lessons lose out to soccer practice and games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, Yiddish, I, I, I hope Yiddish has a future, um, but uh, it faces big challenges. Mm -hmm. and just this book that wants to pay tribute to, to Yiddish um, brings all of it in English, in English translation, in beautiful English translations. But that is the fate of Yiddish. We have to access it now in English because, or in other languages, because that's the way things are. And the same thing happens with Latin poets or Greek poets like Homer that are mostly read today in translation. It depends on young Jews in, in passion and on practicality. Will there be, I used to hate when I was growing up that my parents had taught me Yiddish. What a waste of time. They could have taught me French. They could have taught me German, any, any language that would be much more practical. And I was mad with my parents when I was an adolescent. Now I thank them profusely. I can learn German. I have learned French, but Yiddish, I got it in the womb. And I learned it at home, and it is part of my part of my metabolism, and I'm very proud of that. Well, it's lovely. And the next question is: Is Galicia part of the Pale of Settlement? Galicia, and remember, there's Galicia in Spain and ah. Galicia in Poland. In the Pale of Settlement. Uh, this uh, for the for the person who's asking, is was defined uh, early on by the Russian Tsar as the place where the Jews were allowed to live. It was kind of a, a geographic ghetto where the Jews were invited to live in nowhere else. Today, it is simply said it's the pale, the pale of settlement, but Jews quickly started to uh, attempt breaching out into other parts, not you know, concur, uh, uh, parallel to, but uh, but sometimes out of the realm. And depending on moments, the the different governments would give Jews opportunities to to to, to live somewhere else. Um, so Galicia is a, a place that often change uh, nationalities. It sometimes was part of Poland, and uh, then it would switch. Uh, uh, but it, it was part, as far as I understand, of the Pale of Settlement um, and certainly of the spirit of the Pale of Settlement that was that region where the Jews were allowed to live. Thank you. And um, we had a question about, is the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst a quasi army and navy for the language. So, uh, <laughs> and, and a reply from someone else in chat that says it is an amazing pearl of an oyster, only uh, kosher. <laughs> it's a great place, awesome website too. So <laughs> Absolutely. The Yiddish Book Center is a jewel of a place, is a, is a, is a, is a treasure. I invite people to come. Uh, 40 years for any nonprofit institution is quite astonishing. And it, it has been devoted to rescuing uh, Yiddish books that the older generation was throwing away, uh, picking them up with U-Hauls, and then bringing them back, cataloging them, and sending them to uh, libraries all over the world, uh, to, new, to new schools that are learning Yiddish, and simply cataloging them. Um, the Yiddish Book Center, I would not describe as an army or a navy. Um, you know, that question is often asked. I, I love Spanglish, and I often use that Yiddish image that the difference between a dialect and a language is that the language has an army and a navy. And I do believe that Spanglish has an army and a navy in that it has incredible media. There are two television stations, eh, Univision and Telemundo, where Spanglish, not Spanish, but Spanglish, is really used frequently. There are telenovelas that are in Spanglish, commercials are in Spanglish, some news are in Spanglish, some sports use Spanglish. There are uh, radio stations in California that use Spanglish all the time, newspapers and magazines. So I think that we can use as a metaphor the Army and the Navy, the kind of media that, uh, that Spanglish has. But 
Yiddish is a small, small language. I'm talking not in ambition, but in terms of speakers. There are close to 50 million Spanglish speakers worldwide, 50 million. Hmm. Uh, there are 200,000 Yiddish speakers worldwide, many of them old, many, many of them orthodox, as I was mentioning. And so we can't really talk about a Yiddish media that would counter the effort of oblivion, of, of putting it aside. Uh, I, I think that the Yiddish Book Center, YIVO, uh, the Klesmer events are a very worthy uh, effort to keep the language studied and alive in different ways. Um, they are modest in comparison to what Yiddish was at one point. Uh, we need more, we need energy, we need passion, we need resources, and we need a reason for it. Yiddish is not going to come back simply because we are lamenting its disappearance. Uh, there has to be a readership for Yiddish, there has to be a need for it. But I'll tell you, just recently I participated in a discussion with the translator of the first volume of Harry Potter hmm. into Yiddish, which is, I think, amazing. My wife says, that's beautiful. How many are going to read it? Three, maybe three, and maybe a hundred are going to buy it and put it in their bookshelf just to be proud that Harry Potter is in Yiddish. But, you know, there are efforts that are being done. I'm very happy to say also that some of my short stories are now being translated into Yiddish, not by me which is even more exciting. That's great. Um, I'm going to start scooching through here because we've got a lot of questions and comments. Um, there is a question from my friend Alice. Are there still Yiddish speakers in Eastern Europe among Jews who moved back after the Holocaust or did they switch to the dominant language of that uh, culture? Some, gee, yeah, very good question. There are still very, very few um, uh, Yiddish speakers in Eastern Europe. It, they are not as a, necessarily the Jews that stay behind. There are some young Jews that have learned Yiddish in order to keep the language alive. And there are non-Jews that have learned Yiddish in order to keep Yiddish alive. And I have met them in Poland, in Hungary, in, La in Latvia and Lithuania, where I was just before the pandemic. Um, in, in different parts of the world, Yiddish has been taken by non-Jews because of the guilt of the, of the Holocaust, uh, because of practical reasons. Uh, but the number of Eastern European Yiddish-speaking uh, Jews or non-Jews right now is minuscule, certainly minuscule compared to the diaspora that was there in 1920 in 1930, before the ascendance of Hitler to power. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> when approaching another Yiddish, Ladino, Ottoman, Hebrew person, is there a give and take to understand each other or do you fall back to classic Yiddish? Uh, when, I, when I meet somebody in Yiddish, uh, there's a little give and take. Uh, my Yiddish is kind of a Mexicanizer Yiddish. Uh, Yiddish kind of already... Uh, defined and deformed by Mexico. We call it also Caste Yiddish. It's like Yinglish, the mixing of Spanish and Yiddish. Uh, but it will take a little bit. You know, when you hear, uh, this is for the speaker, for the uh, person who's out asking the question, when you hear somebody from England, you identify them quickly by their accent. When you hear somebody from um, South Africa, uh, but in the United States, sometimes you will catch the difference between accents and sometimes you will not. And only later will you say, oh, wait, that's, are you from Boston? Or <laughs> are you from Montana? Uh, and that happens with Yiddish a lot, though the world has changed so dramatically that it's mostly with, this, with the Orthodox Jews that that can happen. Um, there used to be a time when people would say this is translated from Litvak Yiddish into English, so a particular type of Yiddish, or it's translated into Litvak instead of uh, or Galicianer Yiddish. But those differences are more scholarly now than they used to be. So um, here's a great comment. Brattleboro is the new Helm. <laughs> 
No, everybody's very intelligent. <laughs> very, very intelligent in Brattleboro. Proof of it is all this meeting that we're having together. <laughs> so our final question is going to be, when Yiddish became a language of culture in the 19th century, did the language change? New vocabulary, more Hebrew, change of syntax? Sure. Yes. When, when a language becomes standardized, first of all, it has a, an academy. It can, be, it can exist. Or simply those, the, the purists will be correcting you. That's, no, that's not how you say it. And uh, you say it this particular way. There is also an expanding and expansive vocabulary. Uh, dictionaries, the moment a language really enters the standardized realm is when dictionaries appear and they are establishing how a word is, is, is sp spelled uh, or and in some cases how it is pronounced, where its origins come from. And it's a fascinating story to trace the arrival of Yiddish dictionaries from the 17th century, more 18th century, many 19th century, substantial amount in the early 20th century and very few later on for the reasons that we've been discussing. So yes, absolutely. Imagine the difference between a early English, middle English, Chaucer, in modern English, the English of the that we use uh, starting in the 17th century and 18th century, and how difficult it is to understand the Canterbury Tales right now. But um, and you need a dictionary. But and we have trouble understanding Shakespeare, but less so Jane Austen. So there, the Yiddish is so old that there are early texts of the 13th century of the 15th century that are very difficult to understand. They're, they are ar archaic in their nature. Uh, they are really a window to the, the, the tongue, the language and the culture of their particular time. And in some cases you need to make intra-linguistic translations. You know, I, I'm fascinated always by the fact that sometimes you have a modern translation of Hamlet into English because so many young people will not understand it. So you're translating from English into English. And there were cases of translations of Yiddish, early Yiddish into contemporary Yiddish because no, nobody could understand it anymore. And that shows you the, the depth and complexity, the history of a language. Very few languages really allow for that, for those layers. Yiddish is one that, that is really astonishing. And we have all these documents, uh, recipe books, uh, 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 manuals of education that were written at a time where uh, the, the Yiddish language was used in one way and then it evolved in different ways. So I invite everybody to, to maybe through the book, how Yiddish changed America and how America changed Yiddish to, to delve deeper into this extraordinary immigrant language that has left a deep, deep mark in us. It has the history of Ashkenazi Jews inserted, implanted, imprinted in every word. Every time we use a Yiddish word, we are communing, we're communicating with the, the Jews that used it in the 13th century and in the 17th century. And uh, it, it, that loftiness and also that extraordinary capacity to adapt. If, if, if I leave you with anything is that Yiddish knows how to adapt, how to survive. And it has not spoken, it has not said its last word.